Hello, and welcome to the Medical College of Wisconsin's Coffee Conversations with Scientists. Now, if you're tuning in for the first time, let me introduce myself. I'm Raina Andrews. I'm a mother, a children's book author, a public health ambassador, a TEDx speaker, and an engaged community member. I'm happy to return as your host of Coffee Conversations with Scientists for the 2024 season. And since 2021, we have been sharing the science behind today's most important health topics. Coffee, co Coffee Conversations is brought to you by the Advancing a Healthier Wisconsin Endowment, which is a statewide nonprofit working to improve health and advance health equity in Wisconsin. And so, folks, I'm just so excited that spring is here. It doesn't feel like it, but the sun is shining and today is a great day. You know, I say this because this is, it's still sweater weather, but I'm looking forward to beach time. And unfortunately, I, I have my own elements to where weight management has always been a struggle. And unfortunately, in a world that often equates worth with weight, it's really crucial for us to break free from these constraints and cultivate a relationship of love and acceptance with ourselves at any size. Does anyone have hibernation fever? Do you go through this as well? So today we'll be unpacking practical tools and strategies to foster self-love, challenge societal norms, and embrace a more compassionate approach to our bodies and weight. Whether you're on a journey of weight management or looking to cultivate a healthier self-image, this episode with Dr. Alexander Boog, who is a bariatric psychologist and assistant professor at the Medical College of Wisconsin, will guide us to loving ourselves deeply and wholeheartedly. Welcome, Dr. Boog. Thank you so much, Rena. I'm excited to be here. Awesome, awesome. And so for all of you out there in the interwebs, what I absolutely love about Coffee Conversations with Scientists is that within 30 minutes, we have a lot to unpack. But what I love is that it's live and it's not just Dr. Book and I, we invite you to be a part of this very important conversation. And by the end, I'll try to get to as many questions as possible. So please write them in a chat and I'll get to as much as I can in a short coffee break. Okay, so let's get into it. Dr. Boot, can you please help me understand as today we're talking about our personal relationship to our body, specifically how we feel and treat ourselves based on our weight? You know, can you help us define the central problem that often occurs with individuals in their relationship to their weight? Absolutely. Yeah, you know, I, I think that this is really a multifactorial issue and, and one that likely contributes and depends on each individual's unique experience. Uh, generally speaking, I'd argue that there's two or three really main components that go into this process. One being how we talk to ourselves, uh, another being our body image, which is really the way that we think about how we look. Then the third probably being social pressure and, and, and everything that we're dealing with within the world around us. I can definitely experience the self, the, the social pressure. And I think in the opening I talked about, and, and you and I have talked about offline, this concept of self-compassion. And I have a sense Others may have a sense of what self-compassion is, but to really level the playing field, field and to have a context for how we'll use this term for this conversation, can you define for us the concept of self-compassion? Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I think of self-compassion really uh, in how we treat ourselves. So treating ourselves with kindness, with non-judgmental acceptance, especially in response to challenging situations and, and perceived failures on our part, while simultaneously recognizing that what we're going through, it's a part of the human, you know, part of being alive, part of being a human being. And so while that definition might vary based on who you're talking to, most practitioners, most pra uh, researchers really agree in three main components comprising self-compassion, mm -hmm. self-kindness, common humanity, and then mindfulness being those three. Wow, so when you say self-compassion, mindfulness, what, what does that look like? So, so again, those three components, self-kindness is the first one. We think of self-kindness as opposed to self-judgment. So when we're experiencing difficulties, when we're perceiving failure, are we being overly critical of ourselves? Are we engaging in negative critical thinking? Are we being overly harsh with ourselves? Or are we approaching ourselves with this attitude of kindness, of acceptance, of patience and understanding? So it's really more so how we're talking to ourselves. The second component, common humanity, we think about that more so uh, as opposed to isolation. So when experiencing those difficult situations, when perceiving failure, uh, are you feeling like no one understands what you're going through, that you're the only one going through this, only one feeling this way, or if other people do have these difficulties, it's nowhere near as severe as what yours are. 
or nowhere near as frequent as what you're going through. So it, it makes you feel alone. Or on the other hand, can you recognize that everyone goes through these difficulties? Everyone is imperfect. Everyone makes mistakes. Everyone experiences failure. It is a part of life. And so recognizing that you're not alone in this experience. And then that, I'll go ahead for you to say something, Rena. No, no, I'm, I'm just really identifying with you in the, in the space of self-compassion as someone, this is a safe space, right? Of course. As, as someone who has really struggled with weight management and proper self-talk, I'm, I'm very hard on myself. And so I'm just wondering what the science behind mm. self-compassion and self-criticism really has on your neurology and your biology. You know, as a man thinketh, so shall he be. If, if I'm saying, gosh, you're just so fat, get it together. And you're really harsh on yourself. I'm wondering if that has an impact on your inability to lose weight. It, it absolutely does. Inability to lose weight and actually gain weight on the other end of the spectrum. So with self-criticism or being really hard on ourselves, it actually activates our threat system which is really commonly known for the fight or flight response. Did uh, you say our threat system? Our threat system. Yep, our internal threat or our defense system. And so uh, that fight or flight response kicks in. And now over time, if this is prolonged or it's long-term activated, it results in negative effects, a significant impact on depression, on anxiety, on stress management, on motivation. And so we don't want this thing activated for long periods of time. Uh, on top of that, self-criticism has been shown to uh, relate to eating disorder behaviors, to interpersonal issues, uh, to, to problematic perfectionistic tendencies. It, it gets in the way of pursuing our goals. And so it activates this threat system. And even as I'm talking, I hear myself talking. That doesn't sound fun. It's not fun to deal with. And so that's where we have self-compassion. And so not only does self-compassion deactivate that system, but it actually activates our care system. It releases oxytocin in our system, uh, which is essentially the love hormone uh, responsible for uh, relationship bonding, relationship building, feeling connected with other people. It has this huge impact on not only our physical health, but our emotional health. Mm -hmm. So you, you define self-compassion. Can you define what is self-criticism? Like, what does that look like? And, and self-criticism, kind of on the opposite hand of self-compassion, it's this tendency to engage in negative critical thinking, to engage in negative self-talk. So we're usually focusing on our weaknesses, on our shortcomings, on our errors or perceived failures, uh, usually then resulting in feeling worthless or feeling guilty or, or failure when we don't meet our expectations or those expectations put on us from other people. Mm -hmm. So as you talk about self-criticism can really lead to you gaining weight, can you elaborate on what the science says about the neurological and biological impact? Yeah, and so like I said, that, that threat defense system that's activated, that alone, as that's activated over time, not only does it interfere with, um, with losing weight, but you can actually gain weight from it. Uh, and so uh, neurologically or really psychophysiologically what's happening, uh, we have something called heart rate variability, which is essentially looking at how well we internally regulate, how well you're able to respond to stress and environmental demands. Folks who engage in self-compassion have a lot higher ability to do so. They're able to regulate in challenging situations. Those who don't are not able to do that as well. And so if you're not able to regulate as well, usually that interferes then with behavior change, with, with uh, engaging in healthier eating habits, with exercise, with even attending appointments as needed. You know, what, what's, what's how this is occurring to me is as you talk about your defense or, you know, that fight or flight um, mechanism within us, it's like it, when we're really stressed out, it's difficult to lose weight. So I'm wondering if like us being so critical of ourselves releases some type of chemical that impacts our ability to lose weight and process food and process information the way that our body should, because it's in a, it's in a sense of angst. It, it, it does. Again, this process usually takes place in the amygdala. Uh, so cortisol and, uh, and adrenaline are those, are those um, stress hormones that I think you're referring to. Um, and, and again, in the short term, Yes, this this goal, this flight or flight response, uh, it's it's meant to activate motivation because of a perceived threat. The problem is self-critical thinking is not a threat. 
Uh, and so we're, we're putting undue activation on this system that doesn't need to happen. And that's what's resulting in these problematic consequences. I feel like there's a sense um, in society that we're just not get good enough. And there, there's all this stimulus and messaging around us. Now, could you share some insights? I want to talk about triggers. Could you share some insights into the psychological impact of societal pressure on body image and weight? Mm. It's, it's such an important question. And one of those three main components, I think, as to what's going on with this uh, and, and societal pressure, it's been around as long as I've been alive. And, and unfortunately, I don't think it's going anywhere. Uh, so speaking for myself, and, and I'm asking Raina, you as well, and anyone listening, uh, ask yourself, you know, when you're watching TV, when you're looking at a magazine, how many times have you watched that commercial and thought to yourself, man, I'm not as thin as them. You know, or, or my abs aren't as defined as that. My muscles aren't as big as them. My breasts aren't as large. My stomach's not as flat. My butt's not as big. My beard's not as full. Whatever it is, it is just such a part of life. Most people, if not all of us, have experienced at some point in time. And so my, myself included. Uh, the beard wasn't just an example. That's personal. Uh, and so what happens when we see these advertisements? We start having those, those dialogues with ourselves. We, we start engaging in negative critical thinking, that self-criticism. And, and that leads to that host of unfavorable outcomes, like I was just mentioning. And so we're left with, you know, what do we do? How, how can we move forward? Do we solve the, the issue and try to change the system, which would be phenomenal? I don't know how realistic in the short term. But what we have control over is self-compassion. And, and that's something that we can do to try to help with this. So we've talked about self-compassion quite a bit, but I'm curious, how do you help clients cultivate a more compassionate relationship with their body, especially in a society that often promotes unrealistic body ideals? There are so many different techniques to, to practice, not only incorporating self and compassion into everyday life, but also cultivating it more so into just your regular routine. Uh, one of the first ones that I go to, not only myself, but with patients that I work with, is positive affirmations. I, I find this to be the easiest one that you can do. Uh, so, so finding affirmations that work for you, that could be a, a song lyric, a, a quote from an author or a book. It could be something like, I am worthy. I'm lovable. Uh, may I give myself kindness right now? May I accept myself as I am right now? Or even this too shall pass is one of the more common ones that we see. Uh, so that's the first step, figuring out what those affirmations are. Second step would be writing it down. I, I use sticky notes. Every single person that I've worked with knows that I probably should have stock in sticky notes, how often I use them. Uh, write it down on a sticky note. Put it somewhere that you're going to see it all the time. Put it on your bathroom mirror next to your bed. Put it in your car, you know, where you eat. And every single time you're having those perceived judgments of yourself, those perceived failures, I want you to look at it. I want you to read it to yourself. Say it out loud. The more and more we say things over and over again, we're going to start to believe them. Same thing that happens with negative critical thinking. You can do the same thing with positivity and with compassion. Uh, so that's usually the first one I go for. Uh, how would you talk to your best friend or a loved one? If they were coming to you with the same issues, with the same difficulties that you're experiencing, how would you comfort them? What would you say to them? A lot of times I pose, you know, would you talk to other people the way you talk to yourself? Mm -hmm. And if not, why? You know, usually they say, well, I, I don't want to hurt them. You know, it's really hurtful. I don't want them to feel bad. And so then why do we do it to ourselves? Why do you allow yourself to talk to yourself that way? And so asking yourself, you know, when you're beating yourself up, when you're engaging in that self-criticism, would I ever say that to my kid, to my spouse, to my, my parent, to a loved one? And if not, what would I tell them instead? And can we say it out loud? No, this is, this is just so powerful because I'm taking away from it, Dr. Book, is that, you know, when you put yourself on a diet, on a cleanse, we really have to be mindful about we put, what we put into our mouths, mm -hmm. meaning foods that make us feel good and what we put into our ears, right? What we allow to listen to, whether we speak it or we allow other people to pour into us and what we see. So I feel like this, this mindfulness, uh, like we really should manage that for ourselves. Absolutely. And that's so powerful, the, the affirmations. I've done that before in other areas such as business, but I really could stand to try out some of these tools. And I love the idea of, of a song to help bring you back to a place of self-compassion. Absolutely. Um, so in the space of self-compassion, it's really being um, okay with where you are. But I feel like 
there's a slippery slope between self-compassion and complacency, especially in the context of health and weight management. Can, can you help me unpack this? Like, what are some common misconceptions about what weight, weight management and self-compassion, which is love, that you encounter in your work? And, and yeah, especially the, the first one that you mentioned in terms of compassion and complacency, that's one of the biggest barriers and, and biggest misconceptions that I usually have to address with patients when I introduce this topic. Um, typically, the belief is that self-compassion is going to undermine any of my motivation and, and thus lead to this complacency or, or unproductivity or even self-indulgence. And, and so we believe that we have to be uber critical of ourselves in order to motivate problem is that the research isn't there. It actually shows the exact opposite, that self-compassion is a stronger and a more effective motivator for change as opposed to self-criticism. And self-criticism has actually been shown to undermine motivation. And so it's this, this profound impact on our health. And it's something that we've probably all heard of before, but rarely do we practice it. So, so usually when I'm doing and introducing self-compassion with folks, I'm really kind of functioning as a myth buster in a sense. And I'm really trying to, to you know, provide some education as to what it is and what it isn't. Uh, now, I think you mentioned or you asked about, about common misconceptions as well. So that was one of the bigger ones. Uh, but in other ones, in terms of self-compassion, it's, it's selfish. You know, I, why, why should I meet my own needs when I have to take care of other people, my kids, my parents, uh, my spouse? Uh, one of the most common ones that I work with or have to kind of try to overcome with people is that, you know, the more and more we engage in this compassion, it's actually rejuvenating. It gives you more internal resources to help other people. It's actually been shown to reduce provider or caregiver burnout. Uh, so it's, it's just that that's one of the biggest misconceptions. Uh, Self-compassion is not the same as self-esteem. Self-compassion is, is not letting yourself off the hook or giving yourself, you know, something that feels good in the moment. Uh, those are a couple of the common ones in terms of compassion. In terms of obesity, in terms of weight management, uh, one of the biggest ones, and I think it's still true today, not only from people, but from providers as well, obesity is primarily caused by unhealthy diet and lack of physical exercise. That has been thrown at us since I've been a kid. And it's just certainly not true. There are so many other factors at play. Certainly, these are contributing factors, but sleep is just as impactful as, as not exercising, as unhealthy diet. If you're not getting enough sleep, it can lead to weight gain. Medications can lead to weight gain. Uh, stress can lead to weight gain. Endocrine disruptors can lead to weight gain. All of these other factors are at play. But we often don't focus on them, even TV, even providers. We focus on exercise, we focus on diet. So trying to correct that and trying to educate people that there are so many other factors. Because the other misconception is that people who are struggling with obesity are lazy or that they have no willpower, which is also not true. You know, there's been this discriminatory bias against folks struggling with their weight, again, as long as I've been around. Um, it, and it's been rampant despite this body positivity movement that we find ourselves in. And, and so that's something that, again, education, education amongst other health professionals, education amongst friends, family members, talking about it helps reduce the stigma. Wow, my mouth is dropping because you're absolutely right. Growing up, and as I said, really challenged to manage my weight at a healthy, at a, at a healthy size, um, I've always been told diet and exercise, diet and exercise. Meanwhile, staying up until two o'clock studying, and even as a working adult, staying up until two o'clock, making sure that I have my reports done. I mean, you're absolutely right. Di I mean, diet and exercise is a big piece. So I need to exercise self-compassion. But in that, we have a very chatty um, um, a chat group here um, on our live stream. So I want to turn it over to our audience. And one of the audience members has a bolt-on question to this. Like, can you be too self-compassionate? Is there such a hmm. thing? I, I'd argue no. And, and I, I'd argue no because uh, th this isn't, again, it's not self-esteem. You know, self-esteem is oftentimes thought of as the societal pressure that we need to do something to feel good. Self-compassion is something that we can use when we aren't feeling the best in the world, but it's not automatically trying to make ourselves feel better. It, it's giving ourselves that kindness. It's giving ourselves that, that space to experience what it is that we're feeling without trying to judge it or get rid of it. 
So I don't think that you can ever have enough self-compassion. Uh, so another one of our audience members asks, um, it, it, earlier you mentioned uh, fight or flight. There's something that's released there. And they're asking, is there a way that you can deactivate the fight flight response that is brought on by PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder? Mm. And so I, I'm not as familiar with the PTSD literature, admittedly so. Uh, so what we have shown though is compassion work does deactivate that. And so unrelated to PTSD, yes, compassion will deactivate that fight or flight response. Regarding PTSD, I'll have to do a little bit more digging myself just to see what the interconnections are. My my guess would be yes, that compassion can overpower it. Uh, not saying that it's going to solve you know PTSD by any sense, but it can help deactivate that fight or flight response. Well, on that note, we talked about you know in in this society there's a lot of imaging and um, uh, uh, just a lot that applies pressure for us to be perfect and uphold these unrealistic body ideals. And one of our, our viewers are asking for those who struggle with self-compassion, what are some manageable first steps they can take to be more self-compassionate? You, so you shared some tools, but if you, if someone listening is listening to you and they're like, man, I beat myself up all the time. Like what is the first step they should be taking? I, I tell them it's okay that not only is it okay, it's, it's, it's normal. I hate using the word normal, but it is so common with ourselves. We are so used to beating ourselves up. That is what we have been hearing from ourselves most of our life. We're, we're taught how to treat other people with respect and kindness, that golden rule, but rarely are we taught how to treat ourselves. And so giving yourself a little bit of grace simply right there, realizing that you're not alone um, and, and being patient, that it, it will come with time. A lot of the times people tell me it's not going to work for me. You know, and, and that's okay. That's a common reaction. Give it a try. See what happens. Practice it every single day. Even if it feels like you don't believe in it right now, give it time. And if you really want to push the envelope, I would say start with, with a positive affirmation. Record yourself saying it and listen to that recording whenever you're having that self-judgment and that self-doubt. Because it's even more powerful if you hear yourself saying it. So it's okay, you're gonna be able to work through this, give it time and give it practice and it, it can help. I mean, just even your voice saying that, like, can I just get a recording of that? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, you're all right. It makes me feel good already. And so I, I, I don't think we can really talk about, especially with you being a bariatric psychologist, we can't talk about weight management without talking about the popular drug Ozempic. And one of our audience members is asking the new diet medications such as Ozempic um, are helping people lose significant amounts of weight through appetite control. What role do you think these drugs should play in healthy weight and mental health management? Mm -hmm. I, I love that question. And uh, admittedly, I'm a bit biased as a clinical psychologist. And so I think that these medications can be incredibly beneficial uh, for treating chronic health conditions, for treating comorbidities. My, my hesitation, my reservation is when we turn to these medications, and not just Ozempic, but any weight loss medications for that matter, appetite suppressants, is that we turn to these medications solely to fix our eating habits. Mm -hmm. uh, because the medications work so well. I mean, otherwise we wouldn't be in this medication frenzy right now, but they work so well at changing our eating habits. My concern is that it's gonna almost make us reliant upon them long-term. Because the patterns that we're seeing is that when people, when people aren't able to get access to them, whether that be medication shortages that we're experiencing in Southeastern Wisconsin, or insurance no longer covers it and we can't afford the thousands of dollars that they cost, those unfortunate and maladaptive eating habits, they kick right back in. And a lot of times they come back even stronger than they were before. And my concern is that we're going to start to believe that I need that medicine to, to work on this. And, and again, as a behaviorist and a psychologist, it's just not true. These are things that we can work on without the medicine. And so, so again, I think that the medicine can be incredibly beneficial in treating different disorders or different, um, I'm sorry, chronic health conditions. But I would encourage working on eating habits at least a little bit beforehand, trying to make that behavior change before we take the medicine. That way, it's not going to be as much of a culture shock if we don't have it at some point in time in our life. Mm -hmm. 
Well, you know, to, to bolt on to this question, I'm one of my, my favorite TV personalities, the Oprah Winfrey had an event on Monday. I'm not sure if you got a chance to see it, but she's lost a lot of weight and she looks absolutely fantastic. And if you followed her journey, she's really struggled with weight management really throughout her career. And it's been televised every step of the way. But towards the end of the one hour program, Oprah got emotional when she recalled how she used to think of herself and her weight for most of her life before she started taking weight loss medication and fully understood how obesity is a disease requiring treatment. I'm like, I have this sense of body dysmorphia. It's like, man, I was really, really fat. You know, you have these thoughts of being really overweight when really you were, you were the appropriate size. Can you talk just a little bit about this? One, did you see the segment? Are you familiar with what I'm talking about? And can you just share, um, like, as Oprah saying that she started taking weight loss medication and fully understood how obesity is disease mm. requiring treatment. So admittedly, I didn't catch the segment. I had a lot of people calling me and texting me about it, given what I do. Uh, so I, I've heard a little bit about it. Uh, and so first and foremost, like I was mentioning a little bit ago, I love that people are talking about it. I love that celebrities and TV personalities are sharing their personal experiences and their journey. Uh, just simply because that gives us that common humanity piece that we're not alone in what we're experiencing. You know, if, if Oprah can talk about it, if Oprah can get help, I can get help. I can talk about it. I can work on it. Uh, and, and so it, it helps us combat that stigma behind these otherwise taboo topics like weight management, obesity, even mental health. I know that really kind of kicked in after COVID. Um, people started really opening up about mental health treatment, which is phenomenal. So I, I think that's exceptional, uh, not only that she brought it up, but also talked about it as a disease, which is something that most health providers don't do and something that we practice in our clinic here, but most don't talk about it as a disease. And so um, even that small change can really impact treatment. It can impact uh, patients' uh, ability to get better and, and you know, respond to treatments, but also providers and how we talk to people. Uh, it, it's a huge impact. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I can appreciate the, the approach that you're taking to this question. You know, I have my own opinions about weight loss drugs. Um, but what I will say is from the other shows that we've talked about from bariatric surgery to the different types of weight loss shots and pills and the fad diets, the central voice that I've heard and that I've heard you say today, Dr. Book, is that it is a tool, right? Yes. You still have to demonstrate independence and in being able to make the right choices for your diet and lifestyle. So you still have to move. You still have to get to sleep. You have to drink appropriate water. You have to be mindful about what you're putting into your body. And so I didn't want to I didn't want people to take away that you're promoting Ozempic or you're promoting weight loss drugs. Um, and that what you're saying is, is that it is a tool for people who really need it, specifically those who are battling chronic illness, such as diabetes. Exactly. Exactly. It's a lifelong tool. Well, you know, surgery, lifelong tool. Uh, medicine can definitely serve as a tool, but it requires a tremendous amount of work uh, on those other factors of life, on mental health, on, on even eating habits for that matter too, because it doesn't work for everyone. Um, the only other thing I'd ask or I'd, I'd kind of add in terms of those medications, it has a tremendous amount of side effects. And so if you're noticing side effects, contact the prescriber because there are other options available. Um, you know, I know puking is one of the more common ones with these. So just, just reach out to your prescribing provider. Yes. So um, we'll, we have time for two more questions. I'm sorry for those who are typing away and we can't get to it, but continue typing away and we'll try and, and, and it may inspire us for another segment here. So have you come across the concept of intuitive eating and does this relate to your research focusing on compassion, stress management, and a healthy relationship with food? And intuitive eating, uh, mm -hmm. meaning like very deliberative eating, I'm assuming is what you're referring to? This is from our audience meeting, uh, oh, sure. one of our audience members, intuitive eating. I, I've never, I've never heard of that. And so, I mean, I, I remember coming across it at, at some point of my research, um, but to be fair, I'm not as familiar with it. And so again, I, I can talk about it in terms of deliberative eating uh, or, or mindful eating is another way I kind of That's think about, about yeah. intuitive eating. Um, and, and that relation, I think you, you mentioned in terms of anxiety, stress management. Is that what the question was? I'm sorry. Yeah, it says, um, have you come across the concept of intuitive eating and does this relate to your research focusing on compassion, mm -hmm. stress management, and a healthy relationship with food? 
and, and again, I'm going to be completely fair here. Assuming intuitive eating is very similar to mindful eating, then absolutely yes. Uh, a mindful eating uh, being very deliberate. Uh, is mindfulness is, is taking a step back. It's being in, uh, aware of what we're experiencing, those internal thoughts, emotions, uh, sensations, uh, and, and slowing down. And so mindful eating, it, it's it's looking at this raisin as a common example. Look at a raisin. Instead of just you know popping things in your mouth like we're typically used to doing, like boredom eating or not even thinking about it, um, it's to sit and look at it. It's to describe it to yourself. Move it around. Feel it in your fingers before you move forward. Maybe wash your hands first. Feel it in your fingers. Look at the different things. Smell it before we go for it. Put it in your mouth. Put it on your tongue, but don't chew. Just sense. Then take a bite. Notice what you feel. Close your eyes. Is that changing the impact? Uh, and, and we can do this with every bite. And so doing so, it absolutely changes the dynamic. Uh, it, it, it's directly linked to self-compassion. It improves uh, uh, symptoms of depression and anxiety. It brings it all down. I agree. And, and from the perspective of stress management, I've been practicing mindful eating for the, for the last two years. And there are certain things I just won't even put into my mouth because it's about arousing the senses of the smell, the taste, even like if it sizzles, like the sounds. And it's almost like having a relationship or romanticizing your food in a healthy way where you take your time chewing it, noticing the texture, noticing how it makes your body feel as it's processing. And, um, and so I, I appreciate your response to that. And, and so the last question that we have from our audience, Dr. Boo, is, is there a way to increase HRV, heart rate variability? So, you so heart, that is, what is heart rate variability? I'm not so, understanding. So heart rate variability, uh, it, essentially, you know, we breathe, we live, we have a heartbeat, every heartbeat, it's almost like we have um, this little jump. And I, I can't remember the specifics right now. So this is our heart rate or our heart rate typically. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the variability is, is between the points, between the high points. Mm -hmm. And so uh, right here is kind of like a normal heart rate variability. Uh, but if we're feeling anxious, that might change to shorter uh, heart rate variability. So shorter space in between each peak. Uh, and, and so higher heart rate variability, it, it shows that we're able to regulate our emotion. And so higher heart rate variability, meaning we can space it out even a little bit further. And so we're able to kind of slow down that heart rate. So our typical reaction when we experience something unpleasant, is that heart rate kind of spikes a little bit and it, we start pumping a little bit more. And so our ability to actually bring that back down. And so it's really a lot of emotion regulation techniques can help with this and stress management techniques. Um, one of the first ones and one of the ones that I was taught and I go to a lot is uh, it's actually a strategy from dialectical behavior therapy. It's TIP is the acronym. First one is usually good enough to start. Uh, cold water, hands under cold water, hold an ice cube in your hands. If you don't have ice, if you don't have a sink, we have a pressure point that goes from the brim of our nose, under our eyes, and behind our ear. And so if you put a little bit of pressure here, a little bit of pressure right behind your ear, if you poke around, you kind of feel like, oh, there it is. You put a little bit of pressure, that can even be enough to slowly bring that heart rate down, which increases that heart rate variability. So there's little tips and tricks like that, but that's one of the, the more common ones. That is so helpful. And I'm sure you have a wealth of knowledge that you can continue to share. Um, really quickly before we close here, is there a resource that you can share with our audience that wants to learn more that they can apply at home? Absolutely. Yeah. So, so Kristen Neff, she's one of the the forefront leaders in self-compassion research. She's you know, kind of like the mother of self-compassion, if you will. She has an incredible website that has a ton of information, not only on the myths of self-compassion, but what it is and different resources to, to practice a more compassionate-based life. So I would recommend checking that out. Uh, I think it's, it's selfcompassion.org. Um, I think we might put it in the chat later. Uh, or, or she has excellent books as well. I, I really respect a lot of what she does. And so check her out, Kristen Neff, N-E-F-F. -F. Uh, she's phenomenal. Perfect. Krista, C-H-R-I-S-T-A. K-R-I-S-T-I-N, Kristen. Okay, I would have sent people all over the internet. That's wonderful. <laughs> Well, Dr. Yeah. with that, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate you taking the time to talk to us about this very important topic that I think is very timely. I, I appreciate being here. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And thanks for the wonderful questions, everyone. I really appreciate it. Yes, thank you, everyone. And if we didn't get to your question, feel free to send me a note at conversations at mcw.edu. I hope you all 
Um, join us next month for a virtual coffee break and a conversation with the scientists. Have a great day.